major decisions from the U.S. Supreme Court. First, I want to go to this decision uh, on voting. There was a ch a challenge by the DNC against the Arizona two uh, provisions of Arizona's voting law. So the Supreme Court has said one: those limits on ballot harvesting, those are okay. They don't violate the Voting Rights Act. Two. They said you do not have to accept, allow a provisional ballot from someone who goes to the wrong precinct and doesn't decide to go to the right precinct uh, to cast their vote. So if they cast their vote in the wrong precinct, you can disregard that vote. That person still has the opportunity to go to the right place to vote. But if they go to the wrong precinct on Election Day, you can disregard your vote. The Supreme Court said that's OK. It's a win for the Constitution, Jordan. I mean, the Constitution clearly gives the authority to set the mechanics of elections uh, to the states. And this ruling acknowledges rightly that those ongoing efforts across the states, by the way, not all in red states. I mean, we talked a couple of days ago about some of the New Hampshire laws. It's largely a blue state that they are looking to defend against infringement from this legislative effort to, uh, to, to federalize. Jordan, this ruling today, it justifies the position that we've been advocating for the beginning, that if you want secure elections, the right place to house that authority, as the Constitution does, is at the state level. At the end of the day, the quintessential importance of this decision is grounded in what? Upholding the state's rights to ascertain and to, to determine what are the voting rules in each and every state. This is a great decision favoring voter integrity. The Democratic Party tends to oppose voter integrity measures, and of course, they are disappointed. The Supreme Court, as well as the Biden administration, to point out to any uh, of those of you who may be on the left side of politics who are listening to the broadcast, the Biden DOJ, interesting enough here, said somehow that this didn't violate the Voting Rights Act, Section 2, but at the same time, they're saying that Georgia's does. What this does in a broader sense, Jordan, is it rejects the attempt by the Biden administration and the Justice Department, especially in the Georgia case, to federalize elections. The election process is left in the Constitution to the states to determine the means, manner, and method as long as it doesn't abridge on the basis of race. And that's what this Supreme Court decision, I think the Supreme Court decision is Bronovich versus DNC, which is the name of the decision, is very important and, and is very significant, uh, will be used as precedent, I know, in the district court case pending in Atlanta. This is very recent Supreme Court precedent at a time when the Biden administration and DOJ is looking not just at Georgia, but the 15 other states who, who also uh, uh, pass similar laws to Georgia's following the chaos of the 2020 election and the voting process. The second case, this was in our wheelhouse. We filed in this uh, case because it, of course, affects groups like the ACLJ. California wanted as a state to have uh, nonprofit organizations disclose their donors uh, to the state of California, and they, they wanted the top donors. And uh, the Supreme Court said no. That chills the freedom of association. It can chill the freedom of speech. You cannot get this California. This data is going to be uh, uh, the continuation of the anonymity of donors is important, especially at the state level, so that there is not retribution. The attorney general in California, standing on the broad shoulders of Kamala Harris and other uh, former attorney generals, basically was targeting uh, right-wing groups or conservative groups, why? They want to shriek, shrink the political capacity of those organizations to advocate on behalf of their members. And so this decision upholds both the right of the charities, the First Amendment rights of charities, but also it upholds the First Amendment rights of donors. The court started considering these disclosure cases to groups like ours, like nonprofit organizations, like the ACLJ. Really, it was the civil rights era, and it was states who wanted to know who, who was giving money to civil rights groups like the NAACP. And the court, so going back to, the, we're talking the 1950s and 60s, said on this disclosure, that's when they started saying the disclosure of the donors, the anonymity of the donors was very important. And that to, again, require these disclosures uh, would put, a, again, a, would really damage potentially these organizations, their ability 
to organize, which would violate their constitutional rights. I was reading some of the coverage today, and a lot of the headlines said things like a win for conservatives or a win for conservative groups. And, you know, I do think a conservative view of the Constitution won here today. But, Jordan, if you look at the groups that filed amicus briefs on this, yeah, you know, we filed, other conservative groups filed as well. But so did the ACLU, the NAACP, the Human Rights Fund, PETA, uh, the Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center. They all filed amicus briefs in the case. And I thought Senator Sass said it very well. He said, this wasn't a win for conservatives. This was a win for every American because free speech is for everyone. These are two major victories for those who believe in a conservative view of the Constitution and an originalist view of the Constitution, six, three along ideological lines, but very important victories.